Great. Right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Ron, uh, can you just uh, pop your video off? Thank you. I don't think Ron can hear me. Uh, Chris, you're on mute at, at the moment. I'll, I'll mute myself. Uh, are you able to turn Ron's video off? Okay, you, you mute it again, so I can't, can't hear you. You have to see your mouth moving. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've just, uh, John's is okay as it is, picture. Yep. Oh, he's got it. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'll mute myself again. Yep. Again, just yeah, uh, and just pop your video off as well. <laughs> it's quite quite animated. <laughs> So uh, James, I think um, if you're the only one speaking, then maybe it's okay if other people have their videos on because it's it's going to no, focus on you. Because uh, it, it, it will be distracting when I, when the uh, screen screen sharing is taking place. Oh, because you'll see them in the sidebar. Yeah. Oh yeah. We can, uh, we can probably just get started there and see how it goes. Yeah, I just want Chris to turn his video off. <laughs> Turn your video off, Chris. There you go. So welcome everyone to yet another online edition of uh, Hibiscus Coast uh, Astronomical Society. <laughs> and we're all looking a little bit bushy and uh, whatnot, but uh, yet we carry on so waiting for the day of the barbers. Um, not a whole lot of news to report uh, from our side. Um, there is going to be a competition, though. Um, uh, Ron and a couple of others that might be interested. Um, we next month there is a lunar eclipse taking place, and uh, it's a pretty good time. I think it's about half past eight, nine o'clock. Um, when it happens and uh, we're going to run a contest for the best picture of the eclipse or best uh, sequence of pictures uh, up to you what you do um, there's going to be a number of prizes um, so there'll be a prize for um, you know, the most professional looking one uh, there'll be prizes for cell phone ones there will be prizes for all sorts of things so uh, Think about that, have a look, um, keep an eye on the Facebook group because we'll probably be making an announcement then uh, about that. So this evening, uh, it's probably gonna be a little short. Um, my talk is not that that long, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we're gonna start off with Josh, who will be uh, giving a bit of a uh, roundup of the news and uh, then I'll go into my talk and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, let me get Josh up there. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Great. Thanks, James. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And yeah, uh, great to see everyone here. As, as James mentioned, we hope by now that we'd be back to having our in person meetings. But, you know, because we can't, uh, the best we can do is have these online ones. So it's really great to see you all come out each each time to to support us and enjoy these meetings. So uh, I'll get started with the astronomy news. I'll just have to share my screen. So yeah, astronomy news. What's been happening above us? So William Shatner flies to the edge of space. 
Now, some of the younger people uh, who are watching this might be thinking, William who? So yeah, he's uh, quite famous because he's an ex-Star Trek actor. He played Captain Kirk in Star Trek. And he was part of Blue Origin's second crewed space tourism flight, which uh, launched a few weeks ago or um, uh, last week, I think. And uh, this flight reached just above the 100 kilometer altitude high Kaman line. So uh, this is something we've discussed before. When we talk about the edge of space, um, different agencies have different, uh, I guess, heights at which they recognize, you know, here's where the sky ends and here's where space begins. Uh, but the most recognized boundary is what's called the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers above sea level. And that's where NASA and other people consider, yeah, this is where the sky ends and this is where space begins. And so the Blue Origin second flight, uh, much like the first flight, it flew up. It didn't, didn't go all the way out into space, but it reached just above that Kármán line. And so uh, it's a suborbital sub flight, basically. And yeah, the 90-year-old the actor, William Shatner, is now the oldest person in space. So the Guinness World Records people have to update things, which is quite funny because they've just updated things based on Blue Origin's uh, first crewed mission, which was um, a few months ago now, because Blue Origin's first space tourism flight set four Guinness World Records. So if you'll remember, that's the one where uh, Jeff Bezos himself went up there, along with a woman who became the oldest person in space, a young man who became the youngest person in space, and the other uh, crew member was Jeff Bezos' brother. So, that, um, so they set the third record, which is the, um, the first pair of siblings in space at the same time. And the fourth record they set was the first paying customer aboard a suborbital flight. So their first flight set four records. And now in their second flight, they're gonna to have to update that one record because now we have a new oldest person in space, William Shatner. So also in the news, the James Webb Space Telescope crosses the ocean. Now this is the telescope that's been in development for a long time. This is uh, something that had been planned to be the successor for the Hubble Space uh, Telescope. Development started way back in 1996. It's been uh, $10 billion. It's been uh, plagued by all kinds of delays and setbacks over the, this long amount of time, but it's, it's finally finished and it's um, just recently done its uh, final journey here on Earth. And that's uh, crossing the ocean. So NASA packed it in a specially designed suitcase, they called it. The, the suitcase, it, it's, it's pretty much, um, it's bigger than uh, a um, semi-trailer truck. It's, it's a massive thing, uh, 34 meters long, called STARS, or STARS, maybe if you uh, pronounce it with like a stutter. <laughs> and that stands for Space Telescope Transporter for Air, Road and Sea. And so this specially designed thing was just so that the telescope would say, stay safe in this voyage because it was a 16 day trip from California to French Guiana. And they wanted to make sure that on that voyage, if there was wild weather, they wanted to make sure nothing happened to the telescope because you know it's taken all this time and money. It would be horrible if uh, something slipped and broke during transit. But yeah, fortunately it reached the destination okay. And everything is now on track for its launch on the 18th of December. Pluto's atmosphere is starting to disappear. So this story here is about a 2018 study that looked at Pluto's atmosphere during an occultation. So an occultation or a transit is when a planet passes between us and some sort of other star or something. So in this case, Back in 2018, uh, Pluto passed between us and uh, a bright star behind us. And so some people thought, well, great, this is a really good opportunity for us to look at Pluto while it's backlit by the star. We can kind of study its atmosphere. And so based on that, they did all kinds of measurements and readings. And the results of uh, this study have now been released. And it shows that Pluto's atmosphere is actually starting to disappear. So Pluto, because it's very icy, the atmosphere 
kind of fluctuates because there's a, there's a lot of ice on the surface. And when the planet heats up, that ice melts a bit and uh, kind of bulks out the atmosphere. But when it gets colder, the atmosphere kind of goes back in and, and shrinks onto the planet. And Pluto has a very long orbit. It takes 248 years for it to orbit around the sun. And it's not completely round. It's an elliptical orbit, which means there are some parts where it's closer to the sun than others. So these new findings suggest that as Pluto uh, goes around its orbit over the you know, hundreds of years, getting slowly warmer and then slowly colder, this suggests that over time, the atmosphere, atmosphere fluctuates as well. Um, and so, yeah, so this isn't anything that we should necessarily be concerned about. It doesn't mean that uh, Pluto, is, something bad is gonna happen to Pluto, but it just adds to the knowledge that we have about Pluto. Now we understand more about its atmosphere. It's so also in the news, mirror image galaxy caused by a ripple in space. So this story is about a, a double galaxy, so-called, which was discovered by the Hubble telescope back in 2013. And this is 11 billion light years away. And when this image was first taken, scientists looked at it and thought, okay, right, this, there's something going on We're weird with this image, because as we can see in the image, We've got an image of the galaxy here, but then we also have another version of the image here where it's kind of mirrored. So we've got this like double galaxy plus another one here. So three, three images of the same galaxy all in one picture. And so yeah, this was discovered in 2013 and scientists have been puzzling over it since then. So uh, um, the general thought is that this was caused by gravitational lensing. And so that's when there's something in between us and the thing that we're looking at that has uh, very high gravity. And that gravity can kind of warp the light as it travels between that object and our eyes. And so this is something that we've, we've known about and this can often make some weird things uh, appear in images. Things can get distorted or twisted. But um, this is the first time that we've ever seen this kind of image distortion where it's not just that it's distorting the image, but it's also like uh, doubling it in a, in a mirrored version. So that was quite unique. But there's been a, a new discovery now. We, we've discovered a, a new cluster of galaxies that we didn't know about that's 7 billion light years away. And that's between us and this double galaxy. So now that we know that's there, now we, now we kind of realize, okay, this is proof that uh, the gravitational lensing must be causing some of this weird effect. But the other thing that's been uh, discovered is that this galaxy that we're seeing is in a, uh, a place, a part of space that has a densely packed dark matter. And the thinking is that this causes kind of a ripple in space. So the article that I was reading was talking about, it's the same way where if, uh, if you imagine you have something in the bottom of a swimming pool, and you're standing in the edge of the pool looking down at it, we all know how uh, light can kind of get distorted and things look a bit weird when you're seeing it, you know, through all that water. So the thinking is that uh, dark matter can have this same effect. So um, with, with this particular uh, new information, um, one of the things that's quite interesting is that now we think that maybe we might be able to use this in future. So when we discover other weird images from Hubble or other space telescopes where things are being kind of duplicated or mirrored, now we know more about what might cause that. And so if we see images like that, that could be a way for us to tell whether there's a, a dark matter um, a buildup in that area causing this kind of ripple in space. And finally in the news, a meteorite crash lands in a woman's bed. So this is a story, a woman in Canada, and she was fast asleep one night. She was waking up by a very loud bang, and there was a meteorite on her pillow. So this had fallen through the roof, crashed through the roof and the ceiling, landed next to her on, on her pillow, basically just right next to her head. Imagine that. Now this is uh, about the size of a fist, weighing 1.3 kilos. 
So imagine if, if that had fallen just you know, slightly to one side and hit her, it could have done quite a bit of damage. And uh, when it first happened, she jumped out of bed. She didn't know what had gone wrong. She called the police. And initially they thought maybe this is uh, some debris from a construction site. So they called the construction company that was doing some work across the road. And they said, hey, have you been doing anything that might have caused uh, you know, some, some kind of demolition or debris? And they said, oh no, but there was this really big bang we heard in the sky and we, we, we saw like a, a, a bright streak, you know, maybe that was it. And so that's how they determined, oh, it's a meteorite. So yeah, uh, fortunately the woman is okay, but she is a bit uh, shaken up by the whole ordeal, as you can imagine. And uh, in the news story, she said, you're sound asleep, safe, you think, in your bed, and you can get taken out by a meteorite, apparently. So something for us to uh, think about tonight when you go to bed. <laughs> and uh, that's all for my segment of the news. Um, but of course, when it comes to space exploration news, there's been a lot of stuff recently about something called Lucy. What is Lucy? So I, I purposely haven't covered it in my segment because uh, this is gonna be the topic of James's talk tonight. So I'll, I'll pass back to James and he can begin the main presentation and tell us what is this Lucy? Okay. Yeah, that was quite interesting. I think we're going to find a lot of uh, records are going to be broken with the subsequent uh, flights um, that have been taking place. Um, exciting times for, for space. So let me just get this on here. Okay, so in the presentation today, just to give you a heads up, there are a couple of little video clips. Um, they may not play properly because of uh, the way Zoom is um, in terms of the video. In terms of the audio, you should hear the audio no problem. You don't really need the images you know, to see the video. Um, the audio is good enough, uh, but you'll take it from there. So Lucy and Lucy in space. And what on earth is that skeleton doing there with, uh, what has it got to do with space? So first off, we have a look at Lucy. So who is she? First start off, for a start, she is 3.1 million years old. So she's quite an old girl. And uh, she was found by Donald Johansson and Tom Gray on uh, November 24th, 1974, at a site at Hadar in Ethiopia. And uh, she caused quite a stir when she was discovered. In fact, she was named initially after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, you know, the uh, Beatles song. And the reason for that was that they were so excited because of this uh, discovery that um, they went parting and got very drunk that night and played Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds on over and over again. So <laughs> that is how Lucy got her name. Now, Lucy is uh, a type of uh, hominid called uh, Australopithecus afarinensis. And she is uh, really important uh, to us. She was a young but fully mature adult when she died. And this is quite uh, an important um, Thing because we could tell quite a lot from her skeletal remains, uh, and both as you can see there. Uh, and the skeleton, as you can see, is actually pretty complete. Um, there's all sorts of bits and pieces. It's, it is missing a bit, but um, uh, it's pretty complete for a skeleton that's been sitting around for 3.18 million years. So one thing people always ask is, how, how did she die? And yes, we can actually tell that, we think, from these, these bones. Uh, if you have a look down to her pelvic bone, uh, you'll see there's a little bit of a hole there. 
and uh, they discovered that that is probably uh, by a, like a saber toothed tiger type creature. Um, and uh, by looking at the wound and how it uh, formed and how it healed, they, they know that uh, this is uh, probably uh, what did her in. Um, so we know that how that she was relatively young but mature um, and that she died because of that. So the, the important thing is that by looking at her skeleton and look, looking at um, the way she was and um, the life she led that we can tell from the skeleton, that uh, she provided uh, many unique insights into humanity's evolution. So how did we become us from that? And because it was so old and because it uh, was so near, nearly, uh, I was say nearly perfect, but uh, almost complete skeleton, um, she shared a lot of uh, information on um, exactly how we've evolved over time from that stage to where we are now. But you might be asking, why on earth are we talking about skeletons and Lucy, and that's when we are actually an astronomical society. So how does it all tie in? So we are looking at NASA's Lucy mission. Now, this is the first spacecraft that launched to explore the Trojan asteroids. Lucy was launched just uh, not long ago, a few days ago, from Cape Canaveral on the 16th of October, um, 2021. And it's going to take a mission of about 12 years to have a look at eight different asteroids. The, this mission promises to revolutionize our knowledge of planetary origins as well as the formation of the solar system. So much like Lucy, the skeleton who revolutionized our knowledge of human origins and the formation of humans and how we've evolved. Uh, this mission is particularly going to have a look at these particular asteroids, which are remnants of the very, very, very distant past. And they haven't changed terribly much uh, in uh, several, several millions of years. So um, that is the link, that uh, they both will tell us about the past, about the origins and about uh, how we've evolved over time. So I'm going to start off with a, the first little video clip. Um, like I say, uh, please uh, be aware that it could be a little jerky because of the way it is with Zoom, um, but uh, you should be able to hear it no problem. NASA's Lucy mission is going to be the first mission to explore the Trojan asteroids. These are asteroids that live in two swarms, one that's ahead of Jupiter and another that's behind Jupiter. And we want to go and look at these building blocks of the planets, the ones that didn't get accumulated into the planets, to really learn about the evolution of our solar system. Lagrange points are these stable regions of space. They're around pretty much every planet in the solar system. Jupiter, by virtue of being the largest uh, planet in the solar system, it also has the biggest Lagrange points. And these are little stable reservoirs where asteroids get in, but they never come out. In reality, what we have is sort of a snapshot of what the solar system looked like billions of years ago. Early in the solar system, the giant planets were migrating outward, away from the sun. And at one point, there was chaos in the solar system. Some small bodies were ejected out of the solar system. Others could have been trapped in these Lagrange points. And that's one theory for how the Trojan asteroids came to be where they are today. My job as a mission architect here at Lockheed Martin is very interesting and it sort of encompasses the biggest picture of the mission. What is the trajectory? What sort of propulsion do you need to fly that trajectory? What does the spacecraft look like? So in the case of, for example, Lucy, it's like, okay, it's going out five times further from the sun than the Earth is. And so it's going to need big, huge solar arrays just because of that. Lucy has three scientific instruments on board the spacecraft, and we'll also be using two of the spacecraft subsystems to contribute to the science investigation. 
with the LURI instrument, we'll be able to get panchromatic images, which will tell us about the geology and the crater history, which gives us the age of the surface. With the TESS instrument, we'll be able to measure the temperature of the surface at different points. And with the Ralph instrument, we'll be able to measure the composition of the surfaces. The Jupiter Trojans, they have a variety of surface characteristics. They have different colors and different surface compositions, and that leads us to believe that maybe they formed somewhere else. In choosing the Lucy targets, we wanted to be able to compare different objects that have different surface properties, but a very similar orbit. Lucy will visit one main belt asteroid and seven Trojan asteroids. I don't think there's been a single NASA mission that will have visited as many objects on separate orbits in the solar system as the Lucy mission will. We launch in October of 2021, it does a one-year loop around the sun and comes back to Earth in October of 2022. And that will slingshot us out now onto a trajectory that takes a little more than two years to come back to the Earth. Now we're moving a whole lot faster than we were. We get that trajectory set up, and that second Earth gravity assist takes that velocity and redirects it in the direction we want that'll take us out to the Trojan space. On our way out to the L4 swarm of the Trojans, we're going to visit a main belt asteroid. That main belt asteroid is named Donald Johansson. After the discoverer of the Lucy fossil, we named the Lucy mission in honor of the Lucy fossil because we learned so much about hominid development and evolution from that fossil, just like we're going to learn about the solar system evolution from the Lucy mission. From there, we take a couple of years off and we continue to cruise up until we get to August 2027. And there we encounter our first Trojan asteroid. It's called Eurybates. It's the product of a huge collision that happened millions and millions of years ago. Something big hit it and just blew it apart. And so Eurybates is the biggest chunk of that cataclysmic impact. And it's a C-class asteroid, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of C-class asteroids in the main belt. There's very few of them in Trojan space. So that's one of the mysteries we're gonna get is, okay, why is Eurybates so different? As we've studied it and tried to refine its orbit, we've discovered it's got a little moon. And so we're going to try to get pictures of that too as we fly by. And about a month later, in September of 2027, we're uh, encountering our second Trojan asteroid, Apollome. So it's one of the smaller objects. We're flying by at about six, seven kilometers per second. We have to take pictures like crazy as we fly by, but we're not stopping at any of these. We come to our next object, <laughs> Lucas. It's wash, rinse, repeat. And so we snap pictures like crazy at Lucas. And then about seven months after that, we do the exact same thing at another object called Oris. And that's the last level four swarm object we're going to be visiting. And from there, we start dropping down back into the inner solar system now. So we were out past Jupiter's orbit a little ways. Now we're falling back in towards the Earth. So the trajectory is sort of set up to sort of return back to Earth for free. And we use that to redirect the trajectory now towards our final Trojan asteroid. And so this is an object out in the L5 swarm. So it's trailing Jupiter by about 60 degrees. It's a roughly equal mass binary system called Patroclus and Menin. You can imagine it's sort of like this dumbbell in space. So imagine a great big dumbbell spinning around, you know, but there's no bar there. It's just the objects orbiting each other. It's a very rare thing to find in the inner solar system. However, if you look out past the orbit of Pluto, equal mass binaries are kind of common up there. Another clue is like, okay, are these objects in the Trojan swarm? Are they maybe related to the Kuiper Belt objects out there past Jupiter? And if they are, this would be amazing. We can go and visit Kuiper Belt objects by just going out to Jupiter. We really have never seen Trojan asteroids up close before. We want to understand their geology. Look at the craters on the surface to understand the history of their surfaces. Understand the composition of their surfaces so that we can maybe learn something about where they formed. And all of those will be clues to help us understand how the solar system evolved. Okay, so that's giving you a bit of an overview. We are going to have a look at a, a, a couple of the things they mentioned a little bit more uh, in depth. So the very first thing that comes up is what is a Trojan asteroid? Um, it can be summed up quite easily. A 
Trojan asteroid is any one of a number of asteroids that occupy stable Lagrangian points in a planet's orbit around the sun. So these Trojans are not necessarily only around Jupiter. It just happens that Jupiter has quite a lot of them. Uh, Saturn has a few of them. Mars has a few of them. And Earth has even uh, got two of them that have been confirmed. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to actually find our ones because uh, they're quite small. Um, but they are there nonetheless. Um, when we talk about Trojan asteroids in general terms, very general terms, usually we refer to these the asteroids that accompany Jupiter. So much like in this, this image, uh, you'll see that there are uh, some asteroids in front of Jupiter and some of them uh, behind Jupiter. So asteroids in the leading, or what we call the L4 orbit, so the ones going before Jupiter, are named after Greek heroes. And those that are trailing, so those that follow Jupiter, are named after the heroes of Troy. Um, so that is how they have get their names. There are one or two that are a bit confusing. So there's a Greek one, a uh, Greek name that's in the, uh, the Troy uh, heroes. And there's a Trojan hero that's uh, in amongst the Greek ones. And they call them uh, the spies, the Greek spy is what they call it. But we, we won't get too much into that uh, at the moment. So how many of these things are actually um, near Jupiter? So we're looking at about a million Jupiter Trojans, one kilometer in size or larger. So that doesn't take into account anything that's less than a kilometer that might be lurking there. Um, we also find that uh, Lagrange point four has more asteroids in it than Lagrange point five. Um, so quite an interesting uh, little setup there um, for those who didn't know about Trojan asteroids. So Lucy will arrive at the L4 Trojan cloud in 2027. So we've got a couple of years to wait for that one, uh, but it's going to be worth the wait, I think. So how will Lucy actually get there? As mentioned uh, in the, uh, the video, and I'll, I've got another little clip of it, which I'll play next. Um, it's this really complicated uh, system where Lucy uses Earth as a slingshot to increase its speed. Uh, and that way it can get to those uh, Trojans quite quickly, uh, relatively speaking. Um, and with uh, all sorts of fancy uh, orbital mechanics, uh, comes back to Earth and it gets slingshotted out to the L5 Trojans. So quite amazing. Now, you might think, all right, if there are a million of these things, and well, maybe half a million each uh, uh, Lagrange point, what on Earth, how do they pick which ones to, to go for? You know? Are there some that are more important than others, or you know, was it just pure luck? Or, well, here's mission uh, uh, trajectory designer uh, Brian Sutter, who came up with how he dis he discovered which ones he he is going to send this uh, spaceship to. So this is an audio only. Now I wanted to find things that were sort of along the way that we could fly by, and I didn't really have to change my trajectory too much to get to it. Now there's 750,000 known asteroids out there. I'm not sure how many of them are Trojans, but it's probably on the order of 50,000 or so. I wasn't gonna go and do each of those by hand. It would have taken the rest of my life and it would have been a whole lot of work and even I'm not up to that challenge. And so I thought, what's the quickest way that I can go ahead and evaluate all of these targets and find out, are we accidentally flying close to anything already? And so I, Excel. It's a bunch of little cells and you put numbers in. And sometimes if you're really ambitious, you put equations in there. You can also build sort of a capability to have a program cycle through Excel. And so it's called a macro. And so I went ahead and built a little macro that said, okay, go ahead and cycle through 
your Excel spreadsheet for all 750,000 asteroids. So now that I had this whole thing put together, I could go ahead and just say, okay, here's what I think the Lucy trajectory looks like. I could push the button. This Excel spreadsheet would just start chugging away. Numbers are flying by on the screen. And then if we accidentally basically flew kind of close to an object as we were flying our nominal trajectory, it would go ahead and say, oh, look, here's a hit. We'll save that one. Oh, look, here's another one. Save that one away. So at the end of the day, when I was all done doing my regular work before I left to go home, I go ahead and start this spreadsheet up. And it's like, okay, it's going to chew up my computer, but I don't care. I'm not here. I'll just let it run all you know overnight and I'll have a surprise waiting for me in the morning. And so sure enough, I would come into work and there'd be a little list of maybe 10 asteroids that it said, yeah, these are the things that the Lucy spacecraft is going to fly close to. I take those targets, put them into my higher fidelity simulation just to make sure that I wasn't fooling myself, make sure that it confirmed what my Excel spreadsheet low fidelity simulation was telling me. And when I um, had a few of those targets narrowed down, then I go ahead and get on the phone to HAL or PI and say, okay, flying close to these guys, are these of any interest to you? The more targets I added in, the harder it became for that trajectory optimization to solve the problem. And so what was initially maybe a few hours worth of targeting and optimization within the simulation ultimately became each run would take maybe three or four days and so, you know, that whole process was about six months worth of work. Yeah, so that was quite interesting. Uh, Ria, I wonder if you could just uh, take your uh, video off there. So if we have a look at uh, this little diagram here, uh, this is just basically one of those diagrams that uh, we had previously uh, in that, that video. So let's have a quick look at how it goes. So there it goes once around and gets the slingshot out into the high, much higher orbit, comes back, gets slingshotted out again, intercepts Donald Johansson, and then shoots out to the L4 uh, Trojans. That slows down a bit and it gets the next couple of uh, asteroids before curving back towards Earth and uses Earth again to shoot out again to the L5 point. And gets the, the binary system there and that's where we stop, I'm afraid. I'll be trying to find out what happens after this mission is complete um, and uh, there's a big question mark there. So it'll be interesting to see if if everything is still functioning and everything is uh, going well um, i'm pretty sure that uh, they will use this uh, spacecraft uh, to go somewhere else uh, maybe uh, perhaps have a look at jupiter itself or maybe it'll just keep in this uh, weird uh, kind of uh, orbit of the sun um, where it's going from L4 to L5 and L4 and L5 with Earth in the way. Uh, I'm not, not entirely sure. But just having a look at the, the Trojans again, we can get a, a rough idea of the uh, diameters on here. So Patroclus is a hundred, about 100 kilometers in diameter, the same as Menoetius and Eurobates is sitting at about just over half at 64 kilometers. Uh, quite close to that is Oris at 62 kilometers, Lucas at 20 kilometers, Polymeli at 24 kilometers, and tiny little Donald Johansson at uh, four kilometers. So yeah, these are quite small little objects and uh, you can imagine um, the planning that went into um, making sure that we could go in close enough to these uh, asteroids that uh, you know, it will be useful. And one of my other um, things, I didn't actually get the slide on this one, um, but the I think the closest it gets is about 600 meters away from uh, so, some of these asteroids. Uh, so that's pretty close. Um, 
or you know, what it's doing. Let's have a look uh, at another little video clip here. The Trojan asteroids are small bodies in our solar system. They share an orbit with Jupiter. There's two swarms of them, one located 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter in its orbit, and the other swarm is located 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit. And these Trojan asteroids are remnants from planetary formation. So sometimes we'll call them the fossils of solar system formation. Their near neighbors might have gone into forming the giant planets. And so these objects then became captured in their locations today. And so in that way, we can look and see what went into forming the planets in our solar system. The main goal of the Lucy mission is to explore the Trojan asteroids. We want to understand where these asteroids came from and why they're so diverse. And this is going to be our first ever exploration of these objects. From the Earth, we can see certain features on the Trojan asteroids. We can see where they're located, we can see their colors, and we can get spectra. A spectra can tell you about the surface composition. A spectrum is when you take light and spread it out into all its different wavelengths. And so you have the brightness of the light as a function of wavelength. So think of it like a rainbow but you're gonna divide up the colors even more finely than just Roy G. Biv. From Earth, the Trojan asteroids are just a point of light and you can't tell one part of the Trojan asteroid composition versus another part. And Lucy is going to be able to get that detail close up. But we'll be able to do that by taking this spacecraft and these instruments to the Trojan asteroids. And we'll be able to see how the surface composition varies across the Trojan asteroids. Additionally, we have really large solar arrays because we are solar powered spacecraft. The spacecraft gets its power from the sun. At the Trojan asteroids, we're more than five times further from the sun than Earth is. So there's much less light. We need large solar arrays to power our spacecraft. And in fact, we will be the furthest operating spacecraft powered by solar arrays during our mission. Okay, so just kind of popping back to this image here quickly. Um, some people might not understand what Lagrange means. So what it means when we have a look at the uh, where Jupiter is. So Jupiter is the uh, spot at the bottom, uh, it's orange spot. The sun, of course, is in the middle. And uh, what happens is at these points where these uh, asteroids are, uh, the gravitational pull of the sun is equal to the gravitational pull of Jupiter. So they kind of cancel each other out. So in those, those areas, um, you get a, a state where the, the things that are in there are, are very stable. Those asteroids are stable. So they move around slightly, but um, they kind of just sit there and they stay there all the time because there's nothing pulling them one way or the other. So Jupiter is not attracting them and the sun is not attracting them because it's, it's kind of getting canceled out. So um, this happens, uh, like I say, L4, L5. There are a couple of other ones, uh, the Grange points too. Um, you'll find, you know, we, we were talking about the James Webb telescope uh, earlier on that's, uh, about to be launched um, soon as well. And it kind of stole a bit of the limelight of the Lucy launch. But the important thing with the James Webb is that the James Webb is going to be parked at one of Earth's Lagrange points. Um, so it will be a, in a very stable uh, place in, the, in the space where the gravitational pull between the Earth and the Sun is equal. So it can stay there without ha having to have a lot of fuel to maneuver around, it can just stay there. So 
uh, as it moves around the sun, so it just you know, carries on that, that same balance between uh, where Jupiter is, uh, where the sun is, and where the sort of null area is. So I hope that makes it a little bit clearer for you. So let's have a look at this uh, little clip here as well. Sorry, not that one. Launching in 2021, NASA's Lucy mission will fly by seven different Trojan asteroids orbiting the same distance from the sun as Jupiter. The mission has four main science objectives. To study surface geology by mapping craters and other landforms to determine the age and nature of exterior features. To map the color and mineral composition of the asteroid surfaces. To determine what's beneath the surface as well as each asteroid's mass and density. And finally, Lucy will look forward to study any satellites and rings around the asteroids. Several instruments are being built for the mission. LATES, a thermal emission spectrometer. LALORI, a long-range high-resolution imager. And LORAL, a color imager and infrared spectrometer. Twin navigation cameras and a high-gain antenna will also help investigate these Trojan asteroids, which are remnants of the same primordial material that form the outer planets and have so far only been studied with Earthbound telescopes. So, as Lucy achieves its science objectives, we'll be opening up a time capsule dating back to the birth of our solar system. The findings will be extraordinary. Okay, so let's have a little bit closer look at uh, Lucy itself. Uh, so you can see in the, this picture, it's about 14.2 uh, meters uh, in length and 7.2 meters uh, in height. Uh, you can actually see there's a little picture uh, of, a, of a person uh, standing there. So that'll give you an idea in terms of uh, a human, how big it is. So as uh, I mentioned, it's got these two massive solar panels on either side and a high gain antenna in the, uh, the middle bit. Uh, it also has a long range camera, thermal spectrometer, a spectrometer and color imaging camera, and one or two other little things which we'll have a look at. So the image on the right hand side is basically where all those instruments are. So that's that little bit that sits on top, just above the high gain antenna. So not a lot going on there. Um, you know, in terms of size, it's, it's quite a small little craft, uh, you know, not counting the solar panels, of course. So let's have a quick look at uh, some of the instruments that they mentioned. So the first one is Lalori, uh, which some of the team members call Eagle Eyes in the mission. So this is the most sensitive camera um, that is on Lucy. It's uh, panchromatic, so it's black and white. Uh, camera. The telescope itself is a Ritchie Cretian telescope, or Cretian, Ritchie Cretian telescope, there's different ways of saying it. Uh, this is the same kind of telescope as the Hubble Space Telescope uses. So basically light travels down the tube, it's reflected back uh, by the primary mirror, travels back down the tube and is reflected to uh, a secondary mirror. The secondary, secondary mirror focuses the light and uh, sends it through a little opening in the primary mirror. And in the case of uh, Lori, it then passes through a couple of lenses and the image is recorded with a charge coupled device. So it's a light sensitive device used in digital cameras in place of film. So this is basically uh, what a couple of our astrophotographers are using anyway. <laughs> so nice, uh, really nice uh, telescope that should get the, the really, really good shot. Um, so one of the Lalori's objectives is to produce clear images of the Trojan asteroids, uh, despite the fact that many of them are very dark. So from a thousand kilometers away, Lalori will be able to clearly see craters with a diameter of about 70 meters. Um, so it sees about 40 meters per pixel at that, uh, at a thousand kilometers away. So that will be about the same as standing at one end of a football field and being able to see a fly at the other. So 
hopefully these uh, images uh, will help us understand the surface geology of the, the asteroids. So it will hopefully provide information about the craters, so giving a, a record of uh, what nearby uh, asteroid populations have been like over the course of history. Uh, it will also search the asteroids, as mentioned, for any rings or moons that might appear. As you heard, they discovered a, a moon around one of them, which uh, they didn't know existed before. So uh, that's a big plus. Or any other like strange activity that can take place. Its ability to see the faint targets from far away also makes it perfect for optical navigation. So this whole um, array will also help Lucy navigate uh, to a point in space. Um, and then it, uh, and the thing called the T, uh, T2 cams, uh, which have a very wide field of view, they'll take over um, to more accurate, ac accurately pinpoint the targets. Uh, which will allow Lori to then focus on uh, more of the scientific work. So qu quite an interesting um, thing is uh, that despite this being a, a, a powerful telescope, it doesn't even use a focusing mechanism. So the, the problem is with extreme temperatures in space, um, the uh, whole thing would sort of defocus. Um, if there was a, a lack of foc focused uh, system on there. So most of the optical system is made out of uh, silicon carbide, which uh, doesn't expand or contract uh, in those temperature changes. And um, that's the way it is. Uh, it goes straight through to the CCD and uh, you get it as it is. So yeah, pretty interesting that. Um, with uh, no focuser. Uh, so it was built at uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And uh, there are a few changes uh, that were made basically to the old New Horizons uh, telescope. Um, and those changes then became um, Lucy. You'll actually find with a, a number of these uh, instruments, they've actually been uh, used on other missions, uh, uh, that design has been used on other missions before, not the actual thing. So New Horizons, of course, was uh, looking at uh, Pluto and Kuiper Belt uh, objects and things like that. So although it's um, got this new composite um, sort of baffle that's on it, pretty much the same technology as uh, from New Horizons. So the next instrument is the LaRalph instrument, I mean, which is the long range reconnaissance imager. So it's actually made up of two instruments, funnily enough. And um, it's got what's called the MVIC or the multispectral visible imaging camera, uh, which is a color visible imager and LISA, which is Linear Etalon Imaging Spectral Array, which is an infrared spectrometer. The beam splitter inside this thing sends uh, the infrared light to LISA and reflects the visible light to MVIC. So quite an amazing uh, technology that's uh, going on in there. Um, because of the, the photographs, uh, that Laurel will take are extremely massive. It also has a 256 gigabyte onboard memory. So that's a pretty large for, for a spaceship. So Laurel will actually be searching the Trojans for any organics that can be found. So methanes and uh, things like that. Um, we'll be also looking for ice, any forms of ice or hydrated minerals. And its images will help us determine the Trojan's surface composition. So what it, what it is on the, just like what's going on on the surface. The team at uh, Goddard Space Center is uh, building, oh, we're, we're building this uh, particular thing. And again, it's based on the New Horizons instrument called RALF. Um, and that's uh, for those who might remember 
It was named after Ralph Cramden from the Honeymooners back in the day. Uh, and it was also used on Osiris Rex. Um, so this has had quite an amazing uh, life on, uh, on other spaceships uh, as well. Not this exact one, but the, this design. So it's still um, a pretty good one. One of the uh, other things about this one is that uh, the power is pretty low, 25.1 20, watts. Uh, and that's about the same as an average ceiling fan, or slightly less than a power of a ceiling fan. So quite amazing that for such little power, you can get such a powerful uh, instrument. It was also important with this to limit the number of moving parts on Lucy's instruments, because of course, move, increasing the number of moving parts increases the risk of part failure. So just like uh, uh, Lori, uh, the Ralph does not have a focusing mechanism. So quite, quite amazing. Um, the surfaces of the mirrors, by the way, they're made of aluminium and uh, they were very finely polished with diamond dust. Uh, to uh, get that reflective quality. So quite amazing that. Next one is the LTES, or the Thermal Emission Spectrometer. And it detects infrared radiation emitted by the asteroids. So this uh, infrared spectrometer allows the Lucy team to learn more about the properties of the, the Trojans, uh, such as their thermal inertia, um, how well the bodies retain heat, and that will teach us about the composition structure of uh, material on the surface of the asteroids as well. So though these things are very far away from the sun, like hundreds of millions of kilometers from the sun, sunlight still heats them up and causes them to emit uh, far infrared radiation. And that's exactly what Altes um, detects. Uh, and this uh, telescope has uh, got a diameter of uh, 15.2 centimeters, or about six inches. And it focuses the incoming uh, energy, again, like the other one, into a kind of CCD detector. And uh, in this way, it acts kind of like a remote thermometer. So it's not technically an imager, but it can take temperature measurements at various points in the asteroid. So that then produces the picture of the surface quality uh, properties. So, yeah, quite, a, quite an interesting instrument, this. Um, the test will also examine the physical properties of the regolith of these um, asteroids uh, by uh, measuring the thermal inertia. So how slowly an object heats up and releases uh, heat is basically what it does. Um, the data produces is, is a lot less because it doesn't actually produce an image. Uh, so uh, the amount of storage is, is quite less uh, than the other one. Uh, it can produce a spectrum basically every half a second, one second or two seconds. So very, very quick, this uh, one. It was built at Arizona State University and um, uh, it was based again on the Cyrus Rex's OTES uh, system. And um, it's also been used on things like the Emirates uh, Mars uh, infrared spectrometer. Um, and yeah, a couple of the others. So much like it's the, the other predecessors, uh, it uses a large diamond that serves as a beam splitter. Uh, so it splits the, the beam into different parts. So quite an interesting little instrument that. So the next one that we have a look at is the Hagen antenna. Now, most people think, oh, well, what on earth is this antenna going to do? It's um, you know, kind of there for communication purposes and that's it. But it's not quite true because 
combining this with the uh, those two T2 cams, which are part of this uh, setup or the terminal tracking cameras, um, can actually um, do some very clever signs. So it uses a Doppler shift, um, um, which can then determine the masses of the targets. Um, and that's just purely uh, due to Doppler shift of that radio signal. So, yeah, it's quite interesting that the communications array can now be used to determine the masses of those various um, asteroids. Um, of course, like I mentioned, it, it, they take into account the T2 cams as well, so they can have a visual as well as uh, see the, uh, the Doppler on that. Uh, the solar panels, uh, as we mentioned, will be just over uh, 14 meters from tip to tip, uh, but most of that is uh, made out of you know, the solar panels, each seven odd meters in diameter. Um, and that's, of course, needed to power the spaceship as it flies uh, up to the orbit of Jupiter. There is a problem uh, after the launch. NASA announced that one of Lucy's 24-foot wide solar panels may not be fully latched. So they're still actually having a look at this problem to see how bad it is. In the meantime, both panels are producing power. Both are charging the batteries and it doesn't seem to have a negative effect on it at the moment. However, an improperly latched solar array might become an issue uh, as Lucy goes further and further away from the sun. So it all depends on what happens. If it's uh, just sitting there and it hasn't locked properly, it might be okay. But of course, uh, this is just gonna take a, a little bit of time for us to see what, what's happening there. One other interesting thing is that uh, there's a plaque that is on Lucy. Now, this plaque is quite an uh, interesting uh, one. So you won't be able to read all of those uh, bits and pieces. So I suggest you uh, probably uh, search for it online. Um, you can find it there. But basically the top left-hand side, which is Lucy October, 2021, that is a diagram of all the planets on the launch date. So if someone in the future or some alien race comes along, they could discover exactly what time, what date this uh, ship was launched. But just by having a look at uh, this uh, particular diagram, uh, sort of noting where all the planets in that are. So the rest of the things are all messages. So there's a, a couple of them that are quite interesting. Um, so the first, first one that I noticed is one that's a Turkish proverb, which says, when the ax comes into the woods, many of the trees said, at least the handle is one of us. That's pretty, pretty good. Um, there are also um, quotes said by Ringo, Ringo Starr saying love and peace. Um, there is a quote by Yoko Ono saying, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Uh, Paul McCartney is uh, on there as well, um, as is uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, he said, the important thing is to not stop questioning Curiosity has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, and of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. Never lose a holy curiosity. Try to not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. He is considered successful in our day, who gets more out of life than he puts in, but a man of value will give more than he receives. And yeah, quite, quite a few uh, others, George Harrison, uh, Brian May uh, is on there with uh, this quote, who wants to live forever when, 
can't, can't read it. It's uh, one sec. Let me have a look. I've got it in, the, in my notes here. Uh, who wants to live forever if love must die? So uh, I think that's that's from the song. Um, uh, yeah, who wants to live forever? Um, forget the title. Um, yeah, Paul McCartney, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Uh, John Lennon, we all shine on like the moon and the stars and the sun. And of course, he he would be there because he was he wrote Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, where the name originally came from. Um, there are a whole lot of others. There's a Serbian American poet. Um, there's a Polish writer and activist, a Turkish novelist, uh, many, many, many um, in foreign languages as well. So quite an interesting thing. I, su I suggest you go and have a look at it. It's quite, it's quite, uh, quite interesting to see what maybe some aliens in the future will find. Okay. That brings us to the end um, of uh, talking about Lucy. Um, so what we will do is, let me stop sharing. Okay, so uh, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Uh, what you will need to do is uh, pop on your video and audio and uh, just say it, or you can just uh, pop it in the chat as well. No one. James, you can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, congratulations. That was great. Very brilliant coverage. It's sort of the news only covers so much. So that, that was that was great. Thanks. Um, I believe it all going well. I, they, please ex um, excuse me if, if they did cover it. But if they're all going well after 12 years, I believe uh, they're going to do a, a extend the mission to look at some other objects. Uh, I, I was trying to find out um, what they were uh, doing, but uh, I, I couldn't find out anything other than you know, the end of the asteroid mission. Uh, but I assume that, that you know, if everything's functioning and everything um, is still going to plan, uh, they will probably go and either, either do a totally different mission or they'll just carry on um, having a look at other um, yeah, other, other of these Trojans. Yeah, yep. Oh, no, it's very exciting. And of course, it's 12 years away too. So, uh, yeah. Now, can you see the chat room there? There's and the yeah. Thing, just so, Why is Lucy's path so weird? Why does it go around Earth three times? It's written there. So, the problem is, is uh, when we launch um, these uh, space probes from Earth, uh, we use chemical rockets, and chemical rockets can only go so fast. And we have to get really, really big speeds to uh, get anywhere within a decent amount of time. So you know, as, as you know, as they they mentioned, it's going to take a, you know, a good couple of years before we get to our first asteroid. So what it does is it uses the Earth as a slingshot. So as it goes around, so if this this was the Earth, um, it'll come around very close to the Earth and it uses the gravity to slingshot out and that increases the speed. And each time it does this, it increases the speed more and more and more. And that's the, the whole idea of uh, why it's so weird is that it picks up uh, speed using uh, gravity. We see the same things uh, with, um, you know, other, other uh, space probes, uh, they don't use Earth as much. Uh, usually a, a, the initial shots uh, uh, to get, get out there, but they'll use things like Mars as a very popular one. Um, so before uh, a space probe will end, end up in Jupiter or Saturn or 
you know, further out, um, it will use Mars as uh, the slingshot. And so it has a bit of a funny path because it goes from Earth to Mars and then slingshots around Mars and then shoots off at an incept course uh, from there. Um, there is the new solar uh, uh, probe that is uh, currently around Venus and that, that neck of the woods. That one's also got a, a weird one because uh, it goes out to Venus and it came back to Earth. It goes out to Venus, comes back to Earth. It keeps doing that, just getting faster and faster <coughs> each, <coughs> sorry, each time. So that's pretty much the reason why the, the, that path is so weird. Um, also, you've got to remember with this, it is not actually showing all the planetary movements in those uh, of those particular little um, animated GIFs. Um, so once you put that in as well, you, you can actually see how things go. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I don't think so. Oh, here's one from John. Birka, does Lucy have fuel and thrusters on board to tweak the flight path during its journey? Yeah, it's got, got little thrusters on, that's about it. Uh, so it doesn't have uh, a whole big rocket engine. So it can, it can adjust it, it, its uh, uh, sort of path, just a fraction each way you know, use, using those thrusters, uh, more for just uh, tweaking uh, than anything else. Um, you know, if it decided that it wanted to, want, they wanted to send it out to Pluto, for example, um, they would have to use uh, that slingshot technique as well, um, and then just tweak the the orbits uh, to get to the right place at the right time. Um, as it, you know, that doesn't have its, doesn't have its own big engine. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? It's the, so far out under solar power. Go out to sort of uh, five astronomical units. I think that's the large, that's furthest distance, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the thing that amazes me is that, you know, like we saw in that uh, one slide, with the biggest ones are about 100 kilometers across. You know, the smallest one is, you know, sort of 10 kilometers across. And it amazes me the science can actually, you know, send this uh, probe from Earth, you know, with all these uh, funny slingshot actions and that, and it can still manage to hit those asteroids exactly on time and in the right place. Now, the science that goes into it must be absolutely phenomenal. Amazing. Any other questions? I think that uh, the, with the, the Lucy mission, it was. Yeah, I, was, uh, I was a bit disappointed in, uh, with the, the launch and everything because it was so overshadowed by the James Webb. Um, you know, James Webb getting packed up and then putting on the ship and arriving at the, um, at the uh, sort of harbour and getting unpacked and things like that. And that all happened while uh, Lucy was launching. So... It didn't actually get the press coverage and that that it should have got. Um, you know, that, that's what I've, I, I, I've thought. That's that's why I'm going to do this this talk is because I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people had no idea that there was a Lucy probe going up right now either. Yeah, now, I I don't know what quite they how deep they went into sort of the asteroid different types, but one of, of course the one of the key reasons you're trying to to uh, look at asteroids is it's sort of rubble left over from making up the planets and of course material that goes up to make the planets gets geologically altered so it sort of spoils the window to look at the conditions of the early solar system. The main asteroid belt, the inner and mid regions are mainly M and S type um, asteroids which are made up of silicon rocks and metals which is a good giveaway that they've already been tainted by geological processes and because they've been sort of closer to the sun and more heat involved as well. 
and your very, the very outer rim of the asteroid belt, and of course those Trojans are further out. Um, in particular, there's some the um, wet C types and the P and D type asteroids are the main ones out there. Um, and the general consensus is they've probably got a lot of complex organic compounds on them, um, volatile such as water ice. Um, so some of the really the pre potential precursors to life. Uh, and, and so it's a much more accurate window to what was going on in the early solar system. And as they also, as they alluded to, we're getting a glimpse of the uh, Kuiper Belt objects, which are a far, far, far further way out. It takes years to get out there. So, hey, suddenly we've got a window to an opportunity, not only to look at Kuiper Belt objects, but also to look at the transition between those sort of inner um, asteroids and the Kuiper Belt objects. And of course, comets further out, once again, they come to us. Um, well, one of the questions I've also heard is, you know, uh, why has it taken all these years for James Webb? And it's, it was, Lucy was very, very quick. Sorry, back two minutes or five minutes. Sorry, I can't talk. <laughs> yes, yeah. it was. It's important. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you know, they they put together Lucy really, really quickly. Yes, you know, as a probe. Uh, and then there was only once I started researching, uh, it, you know, all the sort of subsystems and that, that I discovered that most of them had all been reused, you know, it's reused technology. It's uh, where, where they built things for Cyrus Rex and New Horizons. Um, they basically made a whole bunch of the same probes. Um, and then they could just modify them in a minor way. And uh, there you go. You've got everything ready to go. So it's just a matter of sticking everything together, making sure it uh, passes all the tests, and away you go. Um, yeah. So, you know, the James Webb, of course, is everything was new technology from the ground up, and that's why it took so long. Uh, they, they didn't reuse any, uh, any technology. It was new technology, basically. I think there'll be so. a few people holding their breath when that goes up. Yeah, <laughs> I know I will be. <laughs> the, um, ambitious projects generally have a very high success, a uh, high failure rate, I, I should say. Um, uh, have a look at amateur radio satellites and uh, the last two so decent high-flying ones, which I was interested in, um, crashed into the sea <laughs> and didn't even reach orbit. You know, looking back at Hubble, you know, all the drama that went on with Hubble because the, the mirror was not correct. And we had to send up the space shuttle and to repair it. And, you know, and this is the problem with James Webb is, you know, if it uh, go heads out to our Lagrange point, there's no way that astronauts can go there and then fix it. It's just, uh, it just will cost way too much. 1.5 million kilometers away, it'll be. Yeah. Whoa. So, you know, we're just not in the position to do anything about it. If it even if it's a minor fix, sorry, <laughs> you know, it's a billion dollars just going to be sitting there. Jeff Bezos might want to go up. Well, one thing I found interesting as well is. Um, you know, we, we talked about Trojan asteroids, but you also get Trojan moons. And I think it's um, Saturn has a, a, Tro a Trojan moon. And I was thinking, I wonder how they, you know, how do they call it a moon if it doesn't really orbit? <laughs> Is it based purely on size? Haven't really looked into it. I just found it was quite interesting that. Okay. Any other questions? Um, you can just pop your camera on um, if you want to. Um, or type it in the chat. So yeah, keep, keep an eye on the Facebook page for uh, the competition and also what's going to be happening in the next uh, sort of month or two in terms of meetings. Um, 
Uh, we might have a few special guests on and uh, do a few uh, things that are a bit different as well. Um, so if that's it, I don't see any other questions there. Um, I think uh, we'll say good night to everyone. Yeah, um, it's been a good turnout. Yeah, I think everyone wants to know who Lucy was. <laughs> Of course, Lucy uh, is abbreviated for LSD as well, which was in the 1960s. Was uh, so it was yeah. quite controversial. <laughs> uh, and don't forget, Elton John uh, went to number one covering that song. Might I just put a plug in there for Elton? <laughs> tomorrow, his uh, new album, The Lockdown Sessions, comes out tomorrow, October the 22nd. There so, we go. I know. I know who will be first in line. <laughs> Very good. I've heard most of the songs. It's very good. I've got to ask you: Do you do you buy CDs or do you download? I it's the last album that I bought would have been about five years ago. I think I have been streaming since then. Yeah, off Spotify. All oh, right. Yeah, depends though. Sometimes some nice box sets come out with sort of nice lyric sheets and and, yeah. uh, and, and uh, liners and stuff with interesting comments from the artist. So uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's certainly it's all changed these days. Uh, thanks, Jerry and John and Ron, uh, for your yep. comments. Andy and Nathaniel, Jerry, yep, Denise. Now, I can't wait until we actually have our meetings again. <laughs> well, we're going to get out of lockdown first. It'll be a good start. Um, exactly. But, yeah, it'll be nice, nice to, to see everyone again. Yep, it's all good. Okay, <laughs> anyone else? No, it's all good. I think... Right. Yeah. I and think yeah, we, yeah, we'll we'll just have a bit of a chat once everyone's left. Yeah, you, me, and Josh. Yep. So good. Quietly. Uh, you can stop recording now too. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yep, stop recording. Yeah, it worked out good last time. Um, stop recording.